Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Well, joining us now to speak on the challenges of trying to conceive in Nigeria is the author of the book, The Waiting Room, Volatito Adebayo. Volatito, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We have a little um, bit of, we've had a little bit of um, a delay in getting to you, but we're, we're glad that you're here now. When we talk about infertility amongst couples uh, here in Nigeria, you can imagine it can be very stressful. It's, it's a, it's a storyline and a trope that we've seen across society in films. A husband and a wife will get married, takes a few years for a child to be born, the in-laws start getting involved. Why do you think that childbirth and child rearing is so important to the Nigerian family, family structure? Well, in Africa generally, it is often believed that when you're getting married, you're getting married because you want to have children. So in African setting, there is, if, you are, if you're married, the next thing is they start asking questions. When is the child going to come? When are you going to have that child? Uh, how, when are we coming to eat rice? So um, it is a general belief that children are very, very important. So we cannot, uh, we are not like Westerners that say they are married because they just want to enjoy themselves. No. Uh, in Nigeria, our first priority for marriage is that you want to bear children. Right, that's true. As you know, you know, it's almost like a stigma in Nigeria, especially for women, um, the issue of infertility. A lot of, you know, people say it's a woman's fault and all of that. You know, for the benefit of our viewers, can you tell us the root cause of infertility? And is it a female or a male problem? Well, the root cause of infertility, um, number one, is... Um, let me start first by defining infertility. Infertility can be defined as the inability of a couple who has been having unprotected sex for a year, their inability to have a child. You know, that is when medically you've been, you've been tagged as being infertile. And the causes of infertility um, can be linked to number one, ST, STDs, that is infectious diseases. Then number two, uh, abortion that is not well done, then we also have the cost of fibroid, we also have the cost of um, low sperm count for men, and we also have the cost of um, um, fallopian tube blockages, and, and there are also unexplained reasons why couples can be infertile. Then to the next question, you asked whether, uh, if it is just a woman's problem. No, infertility is not just a woman's problem. It is also a man's problem. I think we should start having this conversation and start telling people that infert infertility is not just about a woman, it's also is also about men. According to research, we, um, research has shown over the years that 30% of the cost of infertility is caused by women, 30% caused by men, 30% caused by both couples, and the, the other 10% is unexplained. So how do people now arrive at the conclusion that infertility is actually just a, a woman thing? I think the, the problem boils to the fact that we are in in a patriarchal society. So e women are just an easy target. And you know, when, when um, a woman is unable to have a child, there is this misconception that she has done series of abortion, that she has, um, she has been promiscuous and all that. All these things has to, be, has to be changed and our orientation has to be changed about this. So infertility is not just a woman problem. It is both a man and a woman's problem. Thank you. Well, the dearly departed Ibiduni Igodalo was also very much at the forefront of the conversations when it comes to turning couples into families and helping. Uh, it, was her, it was her hope uh, before she died unexpectedly to help 40 families uh, conceive their child, which is also uh, 
If you just give me one second, now to some breaking news reaching us now. There's been a foiled kidnapping and rescue of kidnapped victims last night at 11 p.m. in Katsina State. A distress call was received by the state's DPO, Dan Dume, that some Islamia students of Hisbarium, Islamia, Mahuta village, numbering about 80, uh, while on their way back from Maulud occasion, celebrated at... Ungawan Al-Qasim village were kidnapped. Now, on receipt of this report, the DPO led his team and vigilante group to the area and engaged the bandits into a fierce gun duel. Subsequently, the team succeeded in dislodging the bandits and rescued all of the 84 kidnapped victims and recovered all the 12 rustled cows. Now, search parties are still combining, still combing the area, rather, with a view of arresting the injured bandits and all recovery of their dead bodies. The investigation is ongoing and we'll keep you updated on that story. We're well, heading back over to our conversation. Is Balakito still with us? Is she still with us? Okay. Lovely. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Apologies for that interruption there. I was talking about the fact that this year alone, the daily departed Ibiduni Igodalo made it her, her life's work and her legacy to help families uh, c conceive, whether it's through IVF or any other types of uh, conception. When we look at IVF, for example, Outside of the world here in Nigeria, it's a very expensive process. Do you think that that's a viable option for many Nigerian families who are currently experiencing infertility? Yeah, uh, IVF is quite expensive. Even in Nigeria here, I think it costs about um, between 800 and 1.7 million, depending on the hospital you're visiting, the IVF center you're visiting. And so it is actually not very affordable to many couples. But I think that um, there are some hospitals that uh, I think last suit, Lagos stayed uh, in conjunction with a certain IVF center, um, partnered, and they subsidized the morning for IVF. I'm also aware about, um, I, I think in Ife, um, teaching hospital, that uh, there's a structured payment plan for couples who want to go for IVF treatment. And I want to commend um, Ibidu Igodalo's um, foundation. May her beautiful soul rest in peace. She's somebody I, I, I admire greatly. And she did a fantastic job. And the center is still doing a fantastic job. And, and so I think if we can have more organizations like that, more government partnership like that, I think this will be easily accessible to um, to couples. Also, I always advise um, couples in the waiting room that when you want to go for an IVF treatment, it is better you save up for it. Because having children is a very wonderful thing, is a joyous thing. So if you can set your mind at it and plan towards it, save towards it, definitely you have your own children. And I do always advise that if you're going to, if you're going to save, you should save for two IVF circles because it is not usually guaranteed. According to research, at, um, IVF treatment is 25% successful. So, uh, so if anyone intends doing this, it is better for you to, to, have, to, be, to have a rest of mind. It is better for you to save towards it. Okay. I'm not sure if we'll have time to answer this question. Um, we'll just take a short break now. And when we come back, we'll continue on the conversation. Do stay with us. Uh, apologies for the, the second interruption in your interview there. Uh, you know, before we did uh, go on to read that breaking news story, you were talking about how you were definitely inspired by uh, the late uh, Ibuduni Igodale and how you believe that people should learn from her example and invest in IVF if they can. And you also said that uh, with the cycles of IVF, though they are expensive, it is worth saving for two cycles at least. If you could finish on that point. Yeah, I, like I said, it is better you save up 
for your IVF cycle, like um, because uh, it is not guaranteed. And when over the years we got to realize that many women after um, the IVF fails, they are devastated and there's a, usually a mental uh, shutdown. So it is better you prepare, you prepare your mind mentally also when you are going for IVF treatment. And so, and also prayers. As a Christian, I would never leave that out. So when you are going for IVF, even the doctors will tell you that it is not 100%. So I think that you should always prepare your mind for that whenever you're going for an IVF treatment. All right. Well, this brings us to your book. I know you did mention the waiting room. Uh, the connection of your personal experience to this book is quite evident, right? If you can just highlight some key features of your book and the impact it's made with respect to the conversation around infertility. Yeah, the waiting room is actually to put a voice out there um, about the, the silence culture of women and let me say couples battling with infertility. The story is about three women in Kechi, Tale, and Yeni. They, how they, are, they were able to go through the rocky challenges of uh, infertility. And um, I, I'm very thankful the book has been, has been having tremendous um, feedback. I had calls from Canada, USA, and I'm thankful for the impact the book has been making to people and how it has encouraged women in the waiting room. And one of the things that shone brightly in that book is IVF. I have noticed that um, IVF is demonized in our country. I have been in a church service before whereby the pastor said that I, um, Anna did not do IVF, that um, Mary did not do IVF, Sarah did not do IVF, so why should we do IVF? But I am using the waiting room to tell people that there is, IVF is a miracle from God, because God has given this medical practitioner the technology, and, and it, is a, it is a beautiful gift to behold. IVF has made, brought smiles, I've, I've brought joy to many homes. It has allowed many parents experience the joy of parenthood. It has allowed women to enjoy the joys of motherhood. So why will you demonize something as glorious or something as so beautiful as that? So I will encourage women to seek help, to go for medical treatment. IVF is very, very good. That is my, one of my, the reason I wrote that book, to educate people properly on IVF. You can catch a glimpse of IVF there. It is, it is written creatively, so it's something you enjoy. It is not like a science book or a research book. It is fiction, written in a story, an enjoyable um, story. So you, IVF, like I said, is... Uh, uh, like people say, they call me IVF um, warrior. Yeah, IVF has really brought my husband and I joy. So I wouldn't want to hide that. I don't know why people would go out and hide, uh, hide it, that they had, had children through IVF. Uh, IVF children also are healthy children. They are normal children. There is nothing wrong with that. They are intelligent, fantastic. So I think couples who can do this should try and go for IVF. Also, women should always um, remember that their biological clock is shutting down. I remember when my husband and I were going for treatment, our inf uh, infertility treatment, the doctor told us that many Nigerian women, women come late to the hospital. That is why they keep, they keep battling with infertility. No matter how old you are, you should go immediately a doctor diagnoses that you have infertility challenge, go to the hospital and get treatment. And also another feature there that I brought out is that infertility is not just a woman's problem. There are men with low sperm count, there are men with zero sperm count. So we should also put our focus also on men. Thank you very much. I mean, we've established that there are many ways 
that someone can have children. There are many ways that, you know, a couple can become families. As you rightfully said, it could be through IVF. It could be through natural conception. It could be through adoption. But I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on women who perhaps may not be able to have children and are satisfied with that. Do you think that society is welcoming enough to those women? In your earlier answers, you rightfully said that we are still very much under a patriarchal society which makes women feel that they must be mothers in order to fulfill their womanhood. So for women who perhaps are not married, do not want to have children, what role do you think that they play in society today? Yeah, I, I do say that a woman's self-worth should not be defined tied to her womb. It should not be tied to the number of children she wants and uh, she can have or cannot have. A woman, um, a woman should, should, should be celebrated b based on her womanhood, not just about children. There are women out there that don't want to have children and it is, it is very valid. These days we have couples who want to just enjoy themselves soon after marriage. So society should stop pre pressurizing them and they should stop asking intrusive questions. We, when we are not close to somebody, I think the best thing when somebody is going through this is for you to just keep quiet, learn to mind your boundaries. When they don't ask you for advice, why don't you just keep it to yourself? There are a lot of women who don't, have to, who don't want to have children, and that does not make them um, inadequate. That does not mean they cannot function properly. So we should stop defining the self-worth of a woman based on the number of the children she can have. A woman is much more than that, although it is beautiful if you want to have a child, and if you don't want to have a child, let them be also. Now, would you say infertility is becoming more common? And if so, what do you think is responsible for the increasing rate of infertility, especially among Nigerians? Yeah, infertility is becoming more common. I think number one reason is that people are more, uh, are more aware, people are speaking up more. Then another reason that uh, infertility is more common is that the uh, STDs and Infectious diseases is on the high rise. Um, people are no longer, are not as much as protecting themselves when it comes to sex. And also, another reason is that um, I think our lifestyle generally, uh, things are changing. So, and also the aspect of fibroid. Fibroid is another, you know, uh, most African women bat tend to battle with this. That's another cause of infertility. Then we have hormonal problems, and uh, that's another cause of infertility. The, then the low sperm count for men, that's another cause of infertility. And these things are on the high rise now because people uh, are also don't have access, easy access um, to medical checkup. You know, infertility treatment, like I mentioned earlier, is um, very, very, it's pretty much expensive. And so, and there are policies that the government policies they don't they are not even looking at that way at all so these are the reasons why the there's a high surge of infertility using your personal example can you share with us i know you've actually given us a lot of detail and we appreciate you uh, opening up your private life in this way but for, for so, perhaps somebody watching this at home uh, and they don't really know what their first steps are. I know you said that, you know, going to see your doctor uh, as a first option is definitely viable. But do you think in terms of our infrastructure, in terms of our resources, there are enough gynecologists, there are enough obstetricians uh, readily available to Nigerians to make that relationship better? Because ultimately what we do need is someone who is specialized, not just in medicine, but in fertility, in women's issues like this. With your experience, do you think that there, there are enough gynecologists, enough specialized doctors in this arena? Um, I think in medicine, the gynecologists are quite more. Uh, but the, the, reason, the, the issue there is that how accessible are they? Now, let me quickly go to run through my, my personal experience. I was in the waiting room with my husband for seven years um, and I am thankful I had very um, good in-laws. My in-laws were kind, they were not very intrusive. But one of the ways I was able to 
keep my mental health in check was that I stopped attending um, family, any function, not only family, functions whereby I know that people will call me and say, ah, Alpha, what are you people doing? When are we coming to eat rice? When is the baby coming? And I also cut off friends who, and family members who make me very uncomfortable. You know, when people start talking about that, I, I, I tear up easily. It's, it's like a sore. It's, it's, it's like a sore that is ever there. So I, when I was in the waiting room, it, it, was, it was very depressing. So I think people should be careful what they say to people in the waiting room because the mental health angle also cannot be overemphasized. Women looking for, the, for children go through a lot of mental health problems. So we should be careful and tread cautiously. We should have encouraging words for these women and even the men too. We should be sympathetic. We should, we should try and, and walk in their own shoes. Per, um, in laws should be kind. In laws, most especially, should be kind. You think about your children. Would you treat your daughter like that if she's battling with um, infertility? You should mind your words. Stop saying hurtful words to couples looking for the fruit of the womb. Those are the things that, that helped me while I was in the waiting room. And I'm thankful that today we had our own son via IVF and my baby is very normal. He's the most intelligent boy you can ever meet. Wow. You've been a delight on the program and thank you so much for sharing your process with us.